Hello, everyone. Ohayo gozaimasu. So my name is Denise St. Arnault, and I am the interim director for uh, Center for Japanese Studies. Uh, I'm actually uh, here just briefly today because our department is also having a retreat this same day. So I had to run across town and say, welcome to all of you. Um, I uh, don't really have anything prepared, just to let you know we are grateful that you come. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the uh, pr uh, prepared programs, it's an incredible array of um, work that this uh, noon lecture series presents. Everything from art to political science to uh, social science, it's just wonderful music. Uh, so um, we welcome you to this series. Uh, I want to, uh, before we go any farther, uh, thank uh, Alexis Wu, who is the coordinator for this. He's an esteemed uh, staff for the center, and we uh, appreciate all his work. Other staff are here. Uh, uh, Yudi and uh, Jillian are here. Uh, and. Um, I also want to make mention, if you haven't already seen all the flyers and publications over here on the table, uh, don't forget about the Festival of Asian Music. Uh, there's a flyer there, so that's something you might be interested in that's sort of separate from this, and then there's some other uh, materials. So uh, basically, just a hearty welcome from me uh, and uh, Dr. Velma, if you would introduce our speaker. Of course, thank you so much. So welcome, everybody, to the first CJS lecture for fall 2023. I'm Aditi Varma. I'm an assistant professor in nuclear engineering and radiological sciences, and we're really pleased to co-host uh, this first lecture with CJS. So I've been asked to make some general announcements before we get started. The first one being, please join us next week for the next lecture in the fall 2023 CJS Thursday lecture series, and the lecture next week is titled Contested Bodies, Female Imagery in Pre-War Okinawa by Professor Eriko Tomizawa K, the 2023-24 Toyota Visiting Professor at the Center for Japanese Studies at the University of Michigan. We do have uh, se several attendees, hopefully, joining us on Zoom. And so for those of you who are joining us virtually, your webcams and your microphones have been muted, but we do invite you to please use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions that you might have. Um, and we will, when we have the Q&A session, the last 30 minutes from 1 to 1.30, that's when we'll get to your questions and I'll read them out. So rest assured, if, you, if you're on Zoom and you have questions, I will ask them for you. Uh, the live transcription uh, or the closed caption will be enabled if you're on Zoom, but if you would rather not have it, uh, just go to the bottom of your screen, the bottom right corner, and you can disable it. And then for everybody, whether you're on Zoom or in person, please check out the CJS events page uh, for or, or the social media for all of the CJS lectures and other events scheduled for fall 2023. So with that, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today, Takahashi Sensei. Uh, Makoto Takahashi has been a professor in the Graduate School of Engineering at Tohoku University since 2012. His research interests include human-machine interfaces, safety of socio-technical systems, resilience engineering, cognitive engineering, risk communication, and cybersecurity. Um, Professor Takahashi has a wide range of interests beyond his academic and intellectual pursuits. Uh, he enjoys trail running, mountain biking, oh, sorry, mountain climbing and bicycling. Uh, and he's also a fan of 80s rock music, including the Eagles, uh, Journey, Styx, Toto, Bruce Springsteen and Coldplay, uh, as well as the written works of Haruki Murakami, Dan Simmons, Jeffrey Diva, Michael Connolly and David Hal Halberstam. So he's a Renaissance man, um, Takahashi Sensei. And his talk today, which I'm very excited, I'm very excited to hear from him. He actually visited my class earlier this week. So we learned a little bit uh, about his work, but I'm really excited to see his full talk today. And the talk is titled, Significance of Positive Human Factors 
contributing to safety. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Takahashi Sensei. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mako Takashi, professor of Tokyo University in Japan. I'm sorry I'm not wearing kimono as I wear in the, appeared in the brochure. So it is a great honor for me to have opportunity to give a lecture today at the long established, established CJS Thursday noon lecture series. As they introduced me, my specialty is nuclear engineering and my research interests include system safety and public acceptance of nuclear energy. I'm here to discuss with a team from the University of Michigan with whom I'm collaborating on the positioning of nuclear energy. Today in my presentation, I will talk about a way, new way of thinking about safety, which is important not only for nuclear energy, but also for many other socio-technical systems. Before I get down to the business, let me tell you a little bit about my memories of University of Michigan. The so University of Michigan was actually the very first university I visited when I first came to the United States. It was 1987, long ago, when I was my first year of my master degree, the, the year before, Professor Glenn Knoll, who had written a Bible-like textbook for nuclear instrumentation, that was my specialty, visited Sendai, that was where the Tokyo University is, and I happened to show him around a day for sightseeing, which was how we get, became acquainted. The next year, when I was going to the United States for the first time to attend the ANS conference in Knoxville, Professor Noll was kind enough to invite me to his university here in Michigan. That, was, that is when I had a talk with him in his professor's room. At the time, he has Macintosh. I think it was Macintosh SE, which was still very rare in Japan. And when I showed my interest, he said, when I showed my interest, he said, oh, my sons are making some kind of software that runs on Mac. I don't really know what it is, he told me. Of course, you know the story about it. I saw the very prototype of Adobe Photoshop. And Dr. Noru was the father of two genius, one who created Adobe Photoshop, and one is working for Industrial Light Magic, and he is a chief super uh, visual effect supervisor of all of the Star Wars series. So this is my first memory of the University of Michigan. Oh, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I forgot to turn off this one. Okay, that I'm going to do my talk. The title of my talk today is the importance of positive human factors contributing to safety, insight from safety to concept. I will talk about the desirable relationship of technological system and human, mainly focusing on the human side. My research interest is the enhancement of level of safety of large scale complex system, such as nuclear power plant, aviation system, transportation system and medical system, so on. Systems have become large scale and complex, not only in the number of parts and components, but also in interactions among systems and human. I'm sure many of you here in today's audience believe that most of the trouble is caused by humans. Whenever an accident occur, the cause is often and always contributed to human error. And it is concluded that humans are responsible. Today, I will present the view, the way around. It is human who maintain the level of safety and contribute the normal functioning of the system. First of all, I would like to discuss 
the traditional approach to safety. We call it safety one approach. Here is the assumption of the safety one approach. The complex system should be safe as long as people don't do anything wrong, wrong. And human error causes accidents. And the main cause of accident is human error. Failure or malfunction is an unforeseen event, not a problem with the system itself. And systems stop working because of the innate unreliability of humans that is brought into the system. In summary, human error is a cause of accidents and humans still remain a threat to inhaling to the safe system. In this slide, I would like to summarize, also summarize the safety one concept, conventional and so-called compliance-based safety approach. In this type of approach, it requires to follow rules and regulations quite strictly, and a severe penalty is imposed for those violating rules. And level of safety is determined based on the performance indicator, such as number of accidents and injury. And long period of injury-free and incident-free performance directly means higher level of safety. It is, is this really so? This is an example of the some against it. This is the, in case of the huge accident of the deep water horizon that is a drain ring on the sea in the Gulf of Mexico, which caused the world blowout, which killed 11 people after six years of injury-free performance record. This is a typical example of that the assumption does not hold. So this is a fundamental question against the safety one approach. And this is about the conventional approach also, and the safety measures derived from these assumptions I talked in the previous slide. One is to tighten procedure or increase, increase the number of rules to follow. And another one is in, introduce technology to monitor human actions or repress the actions themselves with machines. In these days, artificial intelligence is making these things more fast and faster. People try to repress the human with artificial intelligence, ex expecting that it's more higher level of safety. I don't think so. So, however, simply strengthening strengthen these measures is not sufficient if an even higher level of safety to be achieved. Simply strengthening these measures may have the opposite effect. Safety improvement measures on the traditional concept of human error are likely to be ineffective in further improving safety. I think the change of paradigm concerning safety seems necessary in other words, we need to redefine safety. The concept of safety too has been proposed by Professor Eric Hornagel in contrast to the conventional safety one approach. Safety one is based on the conventional definition of safety, seeking for a static state with non-event as safe. Char characteristics and behavior of each equipment and system structure are fixed and known, and expected human behavior are also known in advance, as shown in the instruction manual. Safety one approach is also characterized as centralized approach or compliance-based approach. On the contrary, safety two is characterized by safety, including dynamic failure avoidance and recovery, and potential for adjustment to deal with change. Once again here, problem is to find the answer to for how can we enhance the level of safety of the system 
features already be highly safe and reliable. In general, so this is about uh, how can we enhance the level of safety, uh, that question. In general, the number of fatal or critical accidents has already reduced significantly in the system such as nuclear and medical system. Here, let's assume that the rate of the accident is 10 to the minus 3. Remember, this is not acceptable level of risk, risk. But if accident or failure occurs, one failure out of 10,000 success cases is analyzed very much in detail and lessons are extracted. Of course, running from failure is important, but now failure tends to be so rare case as the system becomes more and more safe. How about success case? Success case are out of interest and no lessons learned from these cases. I believe there are many lessons to be learned from in these success cases. The point here is good practice exists, not only in emergency, but also in normal functioning. Okay, this is why we need devised and new safety concept that we call safety two. I would like to lay out some basic facts behind safety two here. First, we should be aware of the limitations of our ability to understand socio-technical systems and to foresee and predict possible outcomes. With that in mind, what can we realistically do to, to secure the system? It is not about zero failure or anticipating all risks and preventing them from materializing. Rather, it is about increasing resilience potential, which I will talk later. What can we do to increase our resilience potential? Now here, we'd like to summarize a little bit Confusing, I'm sorry, this is, order is not so correct, but the, I would like to summarize here the character, characteristics of our target system in terms of complexity. We have two types of complexity. Type one complex, in other words, complicated system are because, complex because of the large number of elements that makes up, make up the system and there are many interactions. Systems that require a large number of parameters to describe the behavior of the system such that a change in one parameter affects many others. In such cases, no matter how complex the system is, the cause of the trouble can always be found by tracing the cause and effect relationship. In other words, elemental reductionism is varied in this case. But how about the system in the right side, so-called socio-technical system? This is just an example from the operating room in, team in the surgery, doing surgery. Systems where some parameters are unknown and inherently impossible to know, or where there is no means to measure or control them. When accidents occur in such socio-technical systems, it is quite difficult to find out cause by simply tracing cause-consequence relationship. In this case, we call failure emerges, not happen, emerges, like, like kind of autonomously. So, in this view graph, the historical view of approach for safety is described with a negative cornerstone in the bottom. It started to enhance hardware safety based on the correction of insights for design for safety. It had worked to reduce the number of accidents until interaction between human and the system has become a major factor. Then the focus has been changed to eliminate human error 
and organizational safety cultures are the main topic, became main topic. Common features of this approach is so-called find and fix paradigm. It has also worked to reduce troubles until the number of troubles becomes quite small, which means becomes much more safer. The question is, again here, is how can we enhance the level of safety of the system, which has already be highly safe and reliable. This slide summarizes assumptions on which the find and fix approach is based. First, there is definite cause for things, there is results, and it is constant. And whole can be broken into down into parts, and the parts are combined, they form a whole. This is another example that the elemental reductionism is established. The outcome of function or human action can be categorized as success or failure, definitely. No in between, nothing in between. And the cause can be defined and it can be removed. This is a firm belief behind the find and fix approaches. Some, but in reality, sometimes these doesn't, some of the one is, does not hold. Think about some same, same situations. The very complex and complicated rocket system, rocket engine, that is also, but however the deductionism falls in that cases. However, how about the, the case in the surgery where people are interacting each other, helping each other and using some medical devices. This is, there are many complicated, uh, complex interactions among them. So when some accident or happens in the, in the surgery, now people try to pinpoint the failure, cause of the failure by using the old fashioned safety one approach. And then, oh, this, nurse is responsible for the accident. But in this case, it is quite difficult to pinpoint the one sole failure, this uh, cause of the failure. So in order to deal with the highly complex system and maintain the higher level of safety, the importance of performance adjustment by human should be emphasized it's emphasized in the safety two concept. Performance measurement, referred to as the adjustment to ensure or create work-friendly conditions, adjustment to compensate for what is missing, adjustment to avoid the possible future problems. And the point is, instead of choosing the best of all options, find a usable and usable alternative under conditions of bounded rationality. And when performance adjustment work well, they become a routine practice that is relied upon. And monitoring and management, managing performance adjustment ensure that things work. No matter how much people try to improve safety through the performance adjustment, sometimes accidents occur. And this is the interpretation of how accident happens happen in safety to concept. It is because we have the limitations of human performance adjustment. That is because human adjustment must be made with limited time and information. In other words, have to be done in the limited resources. Therefore, they must face and come to terms with the trade-off between trying to be efficient and trying to be perfect. There's trade-off. So we call it efficiency, thoroughness, trade-off. We call it ETO. This is one of the reasons why that accident occur even when the people are trying to make human performance adjustment. And 
Because of these reasons, human adjustments are always imperfect. In other words, laugh. So I'd like to show you one example from the 2001, March 11, great disaster in Tohoku area. This is about the local line connecting Sendai and Ishinomaki. At the time of the earthquake, two trains inbound and outbound leave the one station called the Nobiru station at the same time. And just after they leave, the earthquake occurs and train stopped. According to the JL internal rules, train crews are expected to direct all passengers on board to the nearest designated evacuation location, which was Nobiru Elementary School. The crew guided in the up, outward inbound train, the crew guided all the passengers to the designated location. And the, when they reach the location, tsunami hit the site and several people died. On the contrary, on the outbound train for Ishinomaki also stopped just after leaving the Nobiru station. When train crew gather 50 passengers into one car and suggested to evacuate to the Nobiru, Nobiru Elementary School as the following the rule. But one passenger uh, from the near area, he suggested not to do so. He anticipated that staying here in the train is safer because we are on the hill, on the rise. And others, all the others followed his suggestions. And the tsunami stopped just before the train. Of course, around it were flooded, but they survived. All of them survived. What this incident imply? It is important to avoid hindsight judgment. It is quite easy to say, oh, just following the rule sometimes have some negative consequences. And flexibility dealing with the situation makes them survive. But this is very superficial interpretation of the, this incident. This is, of course, this is about they're avoiding just following predefined rules blindly. This is true. And anticipate progress of what is going on. This is also true. And also, they need to respond flexibly. This is true. But it is quite difficult to make adjustment while the situation is changing. So there is no conclusion from this event, but I'd like to emphasize the difficulty of the performance adjustment, taking this as an example. So this is about the comparison of the safety one and the safety two approach. The objective of safety one is to increase the things that go, no, no, to reduce the things that go wrong. On the contrary, for the safety two, we try to inc increase the things that go right. And the basic principle for safety one is find and fix. And in safety, for safety two, share good practice and apply. So this is quite mm, easy to understand when I use the health analogy. In safety one, is to avoid disease and injury, to decrease the number of the disease and injury. And for the safety too, it is it seeks for the better health. So maybe safety one or safety two inherently the same and from the other viewpoint. But the main di differences of safety one, safety two is the basic recognition we don't hear, and also the role of the human. In safety one, role of a human is to follow safety operating procedure. But in for safety two, use safety operating procedure for, for reference and seeking for the better. This is a main difference of safety one 
and safety too. And here I have to emphasize the relationship of safety one and safety two. When safety one represents an approach to safety that in many ways differs from safety one, it is important to emphasize that they present two complementary views of safety rather than two incompatible or conflicting views. Many of the existing practice in safety one can therefore still be used, although possibly with different emphasis. And effective performance requires both that people can avoid that things go wrong and that they can ensure that things go right. Okay, so, and I, I'd like to go on to the concept of resilience engineering. Resilience engineering is a concept to ensure, to, uh, to enhance the safety in the act actual practical field based on the safety two concept. In other words, resilience engineering is how to engineer the safety two into the existing system or organization. Resilience engineering is a concept for enhancing safety of socio-technical system where humans play important roles. The definition of safety in resilience engineering is the ability to succeed under varying conditions. In contrast to the traditional view of freedom of unacceptable risk. In resilience engineering, emphasis is on things that go right than things go wrong, and stresses on understanding of normal functioning of socio-technical systems. This graph roughly explains about the concept of resilience. The vertical axis, vertical axis is system performance and horizontal axis, time. And the, here in the B, in the, uh, B it's a normal functioning and the system is stable. And something happens, disaster or accident, and then the performance degrade. And the resilience corresponds to the how quick the performance recover to the normal functioning. So the system with quick recovery is called system with high resilience, very resilient system. And system who requires time, longer time to recover from the degraded state is referred as the system with low level of resilience, which is not resilient. And the point here is, even if the time of steady operations, there are some performance variations, fluctuations, and variability of everyday performance, and also corresponding adjustment exist by the human, even during the normal operations. And the organization who is good, who is good at doing the adjustment in the normal time is also performs good at the time of the accident and also tend to have higher resilience. This is just some uh, um, theoretical assumptions I have never uh, evaluated in the actual during the system, but the, it is just an assumption. And there are four main potentials, not ability, we call it potentials for resilience. One is responding, that is knowing what to do. Responding is defined as the ability to deal with ongoing changes and disturbances properly. And next one is monitoring, knowing what to look for. Monitoring is defined as the ability to recognize threats to be watched. This also means knowing what to monitor to recognize the threats. And third one is anticipating, knowing what to expect. Anticipating is defined as ability to de decide the possibility of developing events, new threats, and 
good opportunities in longer time frame when compared to monitoring. And last one is learning, knowing what has happened. Learning is defined as ability to improve the above potentials, these through potentials to avoid a drift to failure. For effective learning, the selection of forecast events and the methods for de deriving lessons from events are necessary. Okay, here, until here, I talked about some theoretical aspect of the safety tool and also the resilience engineering. From now on, I will talk about some examples from the uh, March 11 disaster in Tohoku area, 2001. So I'm focusing on good examples from the viewpoint of the resilience engineering during March 11 disaster beyond the conventional safety approach. Maybe you have heard many about many things about this disaster, but they may tend to focusing on the bad things. But I'm rather focusing on the good things which is which happened in reality. I, I can show you three uh, examples. And before that, I will show you the photo. This is my room just after the earthquake. I was here in this room, I was in this room, but fortunately, this bookshelf going down toward me very slowly, so I didn't have any injury, uh, and luckily. But the, yeah, I was very surprised. And the, this is also the graphs in the left side, also about the distance from the epicenter to the nuclear power station. As you know, Fukushima, Daiichi nuclear power station is there. And we have another nuclear power station, that is Onagawa nuclear power station, which has three units, owned by Tohoku Electric Company. Fukushima, Daiichi nuclear power station is owned by Tokyo Electric Company, TEPCO. But the Onagawa nuclear power station is owned by Tohoku Electric Company. And as you see, the distance to the epicenter is shorter in the case of Onagawa compared with the Fukushima Daiichi. And you can see the peak acceleration that corresponds to the how strong the shaking occurs. It, this is about the acceleration level in the GAL. In the Onagawa case and Fukushima case, they are almost compatible. It means same level of shaking. And also the height of the tsunami is for both cases is 13 meters high from the sea level, very high. And in the case of Fukushima, that nuclear power station, three units caused meltdown and released huge amount of radioactive materials in the, in the around area. In the, in the case of Onagawa, there are three units. One, unit one and three were full operation and unit two was about to start after the maintenance period. And three of these, these units survived, reached the safe cooling down situations after one day of struggling. So there's many reasons why Onaga survived and Fukushima didn't, but it will take one hour to talk about that. So maybe if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it. And okay, I'll go on to the actual example. This is one example in the one hospital in Ishinomaki, near the Onagawa. In the hospital, Ishinomaki, Red Cross Hospital, all staffs anticipated huge damage and suffers and preparing for triage and medical treatment had been completed soon. In the normal operations, 60 emergency patients are maximum number of the number to be treated. And two days after disasters, one, more than 1,000 emergency patients rushed to the hospital, which is far more number can be treated compared to can be treated. And also 
64 patients were carried by helicopter. And the lobby and the corridor were packed with patients and accompanying family and relatives. So they anticipated and also they were successful in responding by the tentative increase in the number of beds. In the, they put the extra bed in the investigation loop. That was illegal. You know, the number of the bed is regulated by the medical authority, but they did it. And persuade healthy refugees to leave. There are several healthy refugees because there's electricity here. So many people came here for help, but they asked them to leave and give the priority to the patient with more critical situations. And provided meals to patient and staffs could not eat. I heard that two or three days they couldn't eat. So this is what happened in the Red Cross Hospital, that this is a successful cases. In other hospital, things didn't go that well. And second example is about road network recovery. As the earthquake was very severe, the many of the road is damaged. And road is very important to carry the materials, food or materials to carry to the suffered area. So they, the point is that very successful uh, treatment of the this time and of the head of Tohoku Regional Development Bureaus. There's one key person who, who was successful with, and the one is monitoring of the route, route 45. Route 45 is very main, main route, penetrating the area of suffering. And Tohoku Expressway and also an important bridge, they made the monitoring, monitoring and anticipation of large scale disaster and alternation of responding actions from recovery to minimum road opening work. You see, they abandoned recovery of the road, but they tried to open the road so that their uh, cars can run. And responding all available resources and monitoring aftershock, tsunami, and state of the ocean, detaining human resources and devices, and responding to the request for the road opening work. You see, after the one week, I remember there may be another earthquake to come, and we are very sensitive to the following earthquake and also the possible tsunami again. So we need to monitor the situation of the sea very closely. And anticipating the loss of ad administrative functions, dispatching staffs from Tohoku Regional Development Bureau. This is very, it is not a normal case to this kind of anticipation is realized. And also realization of responding measures to disaster by tearing down the wall of sectionalism. You see, there is a <laughs> severe sectionalism and they try to tear down the sectionalism and they cooperate each other among other sections. And third example, this is what I want to show you best, M more, most. This is the about the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. This is about the emergency out docking of tanker at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. As you see, there is a port for the nuclear power station, and at the, a tanker was at the site port and was landing heavy oil from the tanker to the tank in the shore when the earthquake occurred. Operators followed the emergency procedure to stop landing and made narrow escape from the site port before tsunami came. This is the standard procedure for the shipman that when earthquake happens and also the there's a possibility of a tsunami, they have to escape from the port because the ship is in the distance from the shore, it is safe. Even if the tsunami comes, ship can overcome 
But the, when it is at the port, it is very dangerous. They might be crashing to the land. So operators followed emergency procedure to escape. However, the time from the earthquake to the tsunami was only 45 minutes. 45 minutes is not long enough for the ship to be ready for the going. You see, they, they need to warm the engine and it, it requires at least one hour for the cold state to start to move. So they realized that they, the time is not good enough. So they intentionally cut the oil fence surrounding the ship. They have to set the oil fence in order to the oil spill to the water, to the seawater, but the, they cut the oil fence. This is not the standard procedure. And also they also cut the piping connecting the tanker and the tank on the shore. So they, maybe that was rubber and they cut the pipe. So if they had failed to outdock before tsunami, the ship may have crashed against the reactor building and the leaked oil may have caused uncontrollable fire, which prevent the other actions to reduce the, to control the nuclear reactors. They did something by going in the reactor building that if it happens, it may have had the disaster and the situation became far worse, which has actually occurred compared with the which actually occurred. So why they succeeded? Human resources, one reason is that human resources were available using communication network prepared in advance. They had a very good relationship with the people on, on the shore and they, they can gather the people to help them to escape. And also successful sharing of severity of the crisis among related people on board and on land. They immediately realized that what happened is very, very severe things and huge tsunami may come. So that expectation urges them to perform the escape procedure. And another thing is that they were trained for emergency escape from the port. They made drills several times to perform this kind of emergency escape. And also Rida decided emergency escape immediately and may made task allocation and the task priority very promptly. This is another reason why they succeeded. So these are not directly related to the resilience potentials, but the, maybe their organization and their team was very resilient to deal with the, this kind of very severe situations. Okay, so let me conclude my talk using this slide. In my talk today, the human positive contribution has been emphasized where human workers struggle to enhance level of safety in socio-technical systems. In this final slide, the hidden human contribution, which actually decreases the level of severity of outcome when the disaster happens. This vertical axis corresponds to the severity. The lower, the more severe. And the red line is, sorry, and the blue line is actual level of damage, final level of damage. And the red line corresponds to the possible level of damage. So the situation could have been that worse. But because of the outcome of the human struggle of human outcomes, and though some of them are certain pity at lack, fortunate factors, there may be fortunate factors, the level of the severity is finally 
becomes higher in the blue in the blue line but we cannot see this part human contribution so what i want to emphasize here is we better we have to more focusing on the human positive contribution to the safety level so human are not the one just committing human error but are inevitable component and one to maintain safety thank you for your attention Thank you, Takahashi Sensor. Uh, and we'll open, up, open it up to questions now. Just a quick note, uh, at the tables that you're sitting, you have these round um, mics. And if you would like to ask a question, all around the mic, there are these little icons of um, little mics around the mic. So press one of those. And when it turns green, that means you can ask your question and the folks on Zoom will also hear you. So just with that as the preface, any questions? Well, I have one maybe to get us okay. started. Maybe okay, people are still, yeah. still thinking about their questions. If you look at the nuclear mm -hmm. industry, but also other high risk and high hazard industries, okay. do you get the sense that there is a desire to transition to safety? <laughs> Or are we still stuck in safety one? Okay, now at this moment, their way of meeting safety is mainly based on safety one concept. But the, they start to realize that just strengthening the safety one way, in strengthening the compliance or making more rules, they start to realize that they are not so effective to further reduce the number of the accident or number of the injury. So I try to uh, persuade them to become more safety two aspect. Of course, as I told you, safety one should be maintained. Safety one is the basic of the maintaining safety, but we need to add some safety two viewpoint additionally to the safety one concept. So I will talk about the Safety two in the nuclear power plant in Tohoku Electric Company every year, and they are now beginning to understand the safety two concept. I'm so I'm glad that. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Questions? Oh, there's one here. Um, so continuing along the nuclear line, how does the concept of digital twins, which seems really popular now, fit in? to the you know safety one safety two protocols like do digital twins make things safer mm -hmm. okay this guy's a good question you know maybe some of them are not doesn't know about digital twin <laughs> digital twin is a software that precisely imitate the system itself and the partly i agree with you in digital twin can contribute to the enhancement of the safety but the Sometimes I did something I disagree. This 13 twin can simulate the system itself, hardware system itself. But the what I'm talking here is about interaction of the human and the system. So the interaction among human and also the human to the system is very difficult to simulate in the digital twin. So I'm not quite mm, op optimistic to use the digital twin to enhance the safety. Of course, system safety, beside from the human side, can be enhanced by using digital twin, digital twin, but the safety maintained by human using this kind of adjustment is rather difficult to simulate in the digital twin. That is my opinion. Oh, you have a question? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, actually, let me show you, let me show you. There you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that interesting presentation. And you just mentioned about the two um, 
ニュークリアパワープラント、女川、and 福島第一。and、uh, I understand it's take a maybe long, long time to explain the, you know, different,、uh, between 女川プラント and 福島第,、uh, mm-hmm. 第一プラント、what they did. But can you just give us kind of, you know,、okay. brief? Yeah. Okay, okay.、Yeah. Comparison. Right. To okay. One is the, the most important difference is the availability of the external power line. In the case of Fukushima Daiichi, all of the external power line is cut. No external electricity was available to that site. And they, need, they have the emergency generator, diesel generator, which can generate, but they are all they're flooded. By the seawater,、mm. and even if the diesel generator was、uh, available, the power distribution center is flooded. So, if it disables the, all the safety functions, it's gone. And in case of Onagawa, one electricity,、uh, external electricity, one was intact, was okay. And also, the generated one steam and、uh, no, no, emergency.、Uh, Generator is also working. So, this is one difference of Fukushima and Onaga case. And another one is more fundamental. The site level from the sea is much more higher in case of the Onagawa power plant.、Mm. They sited the units maybe 20 meters from the sea level. And in the case of Fukushima, they are maybe eight meters from the sea level. And there's a reason for the difference. In the, in, when Tohoku company built, designed the Onagawa power station, there's one people who are very concerned about the tsunami. You see that we have the tsunami record in that area. When we taking the 100 years, we have maybe two or three. Huge tsunami hit that area. So, one engineer insists that the Onagawa power plant should be made at the higher level, more than regulation requires. So, that is a very fundamental reason why the Onagawa survived. Am I answering your question? It's a human factor. Human factor. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of human factors in the wrong range. And experience. Experience, right. The、right. local people. They know people, yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. what you know, they can expect for something disaster.、Yeah. Maybe people from Tokyo, they don't recognize that. Maybe they don't care because they don't live there, right? <laughs> yeah, in some sense, right. Yeah, yeah I agree. Human, I agree. Human, human, yeah. human fact. <laughs> very important. Thank you very much for your question. Todd, I saw a hand up earlier on. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, in your examples, Um, it seems to me the success occurred when the people felt they could break the rules.、Mm, right? not, the, not break,、mm. but they, they weren't constrained,、mm-hmm. right? Or they had the freedom、mm-hmm. to think outside the rules. So, is part of safety too the、mm. way we teach or organize、um, teams of people to give them? Permission to think outside、yeah. routine? It is a very essential question and very difficult to answer. But one thing is, we don't promote them to break the rule, right? And the, when you break, there's, you see, the rule is have not been made to cover all the possible situations. So there might be some situations you need to deviate from the rule. But when you deviate from the rule, you need to know. What is the kind of negative effect of the deviation from the rule? So, it is very, the decision from the、uh, decision when we d- decide to break or deviate from the rule, you need to understand the why this rule is exist. So, without such kind of understanding of the rule, just deviation of the rule is not good. So, I am very careful to talk about this. Things I'm not promoting, I'm not promoting to deviation from the rule, but the sometimes you need to deviate from the rule. So the decision 
So I'm now, the, what is one of the research topic in my, in my research topic? How can the people can decide and how reliably decide to uh, break the rule? Am I answering your question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you for your talk. Um, kind of piggybacking on that the previous question. Like, yeah. um, so I am from Japanese language education okay. discipline, so I don't know anything about nuclear okay. industries, but it um, seems like the content of the talk like uh, sounds like very applicable to any like organizational mm. uh, building, like a team building. I see, I and see. I was wondering if you have any examples of like um, the very specific practices or like you know principles that I see. you can use in training people. I like, see. You know to I guess encourage the freedom among the groups or like. Okay, you know, speaking of the freedom among the group, maybe you know about the psychological safety. Mm. Have you heard of that? It's a when we. When something happens, okay, think of the situations in the elder one is here and we have a group and the elder one makes some error. And the, and the younger one realizes that he makes error, he makes error. And whether he can pinpoint or oh, you are making a mistake. In some, say, in some cases, I know that, you don't have to say that. So that is not a good reaction. And if they, group it's a developed group of self, psychological safety of the group is lower they are reluctant mm. most of them reluctant to pinpoint so their failure of others but if the psychological failure a uh, psychological uh, safety level is higher we can say very freely mm. and without any hesitation to pinpoint the, some possible failure so it is a kind of the result of the Google research that the group with higher psychological safety is more innovative mm -hmm. compared with other group. Mm -hmm. So it is rather difficult to measure the level of psychological right, safety. Right. Maybe you can use some questionnaire. You can mm -hmm. find some questionnaire to measure the psychological safety. But the, in terms of the safety in the uh, groups, dealing with the very risky situations. For example, in the pilot, they are me, captain and the co-pilot are cooperating each other. But if he sees that some author, authority, he is very, I'm sorry, I have a right He's very, have a higher authority and he's very novice. So novice is reluctant to, to point the possible mistake. Mm -hmm. In that case, it is situation can be risky. So that kind of atmosphere or some level of as I repeat, psychological safety is one of the factors when you think about these some people uh, in the one group. Mm -hmm. Am I answering your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Actually, if I might piggyback off of that question while others are thinking about what their questions are how can we how can we design our organizations and our organizational structures better to support safety too wow <laughs> organizational structure okay i'm always thinking about the resilience of the already existing organizations so i have little idea about the how do i advise to make the organization to be more resilient? Mm, I don't have a clear answer to your questions. But the, mm, you see, but the, in some sense, uh, as I told you, they have four resilience potentials. So maybe the potential for learning is very important. So if there's one company, the, the important thing is to share not organization structure, but also they, they have to share their events or what happens and also the lessons learned for, among, among the 
organization, uh, groups of the company or organizations? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not good, no, good answer. Sense. That makes sense. Oh, yes, please, go ahead. So I know one of the things that you said was like drifting towards failure. Mm -hmm. So do you think that there are industries that are regarded as safe but actually are just in a state of drifting towards failure? Uh, I see. Once the failure state is accomplished, they tend to think they last forever. But it doesn't. It will not. They always drift to the failure. So what we need to know is, you know, we are, if we are drifting, we have to know where we are now and we are headed for. And there is the kind of distance, we, the concept of distance to failure. See, we, when we're dr drifting and there's some edge here, and if they come to the edge and we make failure. So we need to know which direction we are drifting and also which we are. But in case of Fukushima accident, I think I know the people in Tepco company very well. They are very much safety concerned. Some people say that, oh, Tokyo Electric Company doesn't think anything about the safety. It is not. They are very much concerning about the safety. So they are also, but they are drifting. So they are drifting these directions and they think that their distance to failure is enough. But in other directions, distance to failure is very short. So that is where they fall down and they made it. This is my interpretation of the, what happens in the Tokyo Electric Company. Am I answering any questions? Yes, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, thank you, and a uh, very interesting talk. Um, I have a, uh, you were talking about psychologically. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Our people, as human beings, mm -hmm. psychologically. Yeah usually don't want to listen to people if nothing bad happened. I see. You know what I mean? For example, just like a teenager, mm -hmm. if you let them know and uh, do this, it's good. Please obey the law. They won't listen to you. I so see. Only when something bad happened, they learn from the lesson. Mm -hmm. From that perspective. So what do you think? Any comments? How? Would you like to uh, promote uh, your safety too? I see. It's a very good question. I have to encounter. I first encounter. First, I, we are not dealing with kids. We are dealing with the matured professional right. who are very in, intended to be safe. But sometimes they made error. They made some troubles. So if they are well intended, maybe we can ask them to listen to me. So there is no direct answer to your questions, but the, at least the, we need to know that what they are doing and what they should do. And also we need to let them know that concept of this type of safety to concept. And when I talk about this safety to concept in the actual for nuclear power plant, they almost agree. But the another question is, oh, I agree with the concept that what should we do? <laughs> so this is more common questions from them. So at the time, I answered that, as I, as I said, the sharing the good practice is very important, not to tell them to obey the rule, but the sharing the good practice is very important. But the, they doing good practice unintentionally. You see, expert people are very good at doing the performance adjustment, so they don't realize themselves that they are doing very well. So it is very difficult to take out some examples of good practice and to share. So that's what I am yeah, thinking about. And if we ask the, maybe even if we observed their work at the site, but for me, it's very difficult to find out, oh, this is a very good things, which is not on the manual. So what I'm trying to do is to enhance the people working at the site to share 
the, what is doing well? I'm not answering your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense a lot. Yeah, it makes and, sense. Uh, a very complicated uh, problem. Yes, For yes. example, and the people or uh, engineers and the scientists learn a lot in Japan, especially uh, from Japan. Japan experienced a lot of earthquake, uh -huh, yeah. nuclear disasters on yeah. the last 10 years, uh, 10 years ago. For example, how about uh, US? Mm. Uh, US has three mile island, but uh, oh, how about okay. other countries? I see. And the culturally is also totally different. How do you promote a lot of fun? Uh, I see your point. Yeah, topics. thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. Do you have a question, Yuri? <laughs> I'll ask one more if that's okay. We, you know, in many sectors of industry and technology, we're headed towards greater automation, reducing the role that humans play in these complex socio technical systems, which perhaps also correspondingly means that the people who operate these systems, their training is also changed so that perhaps they don't understand these systems as well as they once did. And so in, in this world of growing auto, automation, mm -hmm. you know, AI playing a, a larger role, the training of the operators changing, how, how, mm -hmm. w what are your thoughts on how we oh. might nevertheless achieve safety? Okay, too? yeah, that's a very good question. I'd like to mention, also I mentioned about the automation. I hate it, <laughs> first of all, yeah. no, 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 but the, I understand that the introducing such kind of automation and AI technologies makes the operators load less and the resulting in the lower knowledge about the, when something happens, which automation cannot handle, they, it, the operators may have to abandon. So I think that just introducing automation and AI technology may result in the degraded safety, I'm, I believe. Because what, who designed the automation? Human. And who maintain the system? Human. So sometimes people say, oh, if we automated 100% autonomous system realized, we, can do, we, have, we don't have to do nothing. We do anything. But that's not true. We have to maintain, and some error might be in the software, which human make. So automation does not, may not be a solution to the system in this time. This is my belief. So I don't like the people who say that, oh, AI can solve everything. I don't, like, I don't think so. AI is also made by human. And also, some people say that AI autonomously run and the, and the some level of the intelligence becomes very higher in the singularity come, but I don't think so. We still need human to maintain the system. And in, in case of the, yeah, that is my very uh, concern that the, even if the automation system gets better, better and better, and then our ability to control and understanding the system becomes row and row and row. So maybe we need something to do to keep our uh, skill or knowledge level not to decrease, even if the system becomes more autonomous and automated. So would you suggest any guidelines or heuristics for determining what the appropriate level of automation mm, is. It depends Maybe on... Maybe it's a research project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is... Okay, yeah, that might be a research project. I'm, at, I'm very interested in that. In that yeah. Okay, um, can I just... Yeah. A, can I just make an additional comment to yeah. support your comment? Okay. Um, actually, you know, I'm in automotive industry. So oh. I've been visiting some, you know, plant, mm -hmm. and what they do is the, a lot of plant, I mean, including suppliers, they are well automated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they use um, uh, electric ground vehicle. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is like a robot, right? And then they have a you know, pokayoke. Pokayoke means okay, okay. fruit, you know, fruit. And if something wrong, 
they just stop the light, something like that. And uh, they use a camera, okay? So they are pretty much automated. And uh, of course, they use AI. However, what they do is, if something happens, and uh, if they just find that uh, any non-conformity or whatever mm -hmm. the issue, mm -hmm. they have a video. Oh. Uh -huh. Because uh, they have a camera, I right? See, I see. So the human being, engineer or operator, take a look at and find the causes. So they exactly know what's wrong. I see, I see. Yeah. So very interesting. Very interesting. But the human is always monitored yes. by the camera. Yes. Which they don't like. They always monitored. Even if the as she said, at the automated system exists. It's a collaboration with the human and that system is not good at this moment. This is my belief. Thank yeah, you very I much. Just, yeah, I just yeah. thought about it, yeah. you know. Thank you very much for a good comment. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I was wondering if you could speak to how like public opinion or media interact with these, because you mentioned people thinking that, oh, the energy company doesn't care about safety. Does that interact with how these like two safety models operate? Or, you know, I'm trying to, sorry, it's not super articulate, you, but. You're asking about the some media. Media, public opinion, if that interacts with these safety these models. kind of things? Yeah. Well, they're not interested. <laughs> Maybe they're always talking about the safety one aspect. Something happens, a human error. It is very easy to say that this is human error, that's all. Mm -hmm. But the, we need to more find out the reason behind mm -hmm. the human error. So for the, for the media or general public, only understand the, what happens in the way of safety, safety one aspect, because it is quite easy to understand. Mm -hmm. But the actual, what happening is more complicated and more yeah holistic but that is what the media doesn't want to talk about am i answering question thank you very much <laughs> thank you for our audience member on zoom who just asked the question all right this is ernie king who uh -huh. asks to what extent do you see self-driving cars using safety too? No. <laughs> self-driving car, it's a kind of related to the autonomous things. I don't think there's nothing to do with the safety too, because safety at autonomous driving car is only, they are not thinking about this. Just, they, they just make to avoid the accident and the, in the safety ones aspect. So I have never heard, I have never think of the some aspect which autonomous car taking into consideration the safety two aspect. But the, in some sense there, you see, now they're learning how to drive every day. And the learning algorithm can learn the human driving and how they manage to avoid the accident. So that's what they, enhance the good practice in the autonomous driving but this is i'm not quite sure about that but i don't like the autonomous driving <laughs> so the, i'm sorry i hate everything <laughs> but the Lots yeah of people the, seem to agree with you i'm glad to hear that yeah. I, I i agree too more questions i have so many questions i'll just keep asking if, if you all <laughs> okay. don't have any more oh you have one please go ahead I kind of have one piggybacking on what you were saying. I wonder, this is just what I've been thinking, like with safety too, it seems important to make the public more aware that there should be more conversation about what to do right and like be a, be a permission to these people who are knowledgeable about situations to mm -hmm. in the situations necessary, mm -hmm. change maybe what was regulated and like in Japan, for instance, the criticism about maybe what things did wrong, mm. that could potentially bar like safety too from, like people maybe need to be less scared of repercussions when they're mm. trying to actively enact safety too measures. I see, yeah, I see your point. Yeah, they're always focusing on the bad side of the things and they're always criticizing it. 
that it does not result in the good lessons to be learned to increase the level of safety. So I think in that aspect, I do think the safety two aspect is more important to make us some more fruitful discussion to things, makes things better. Thank you for your comment. I'll ask one more and then maybe one or two final questions after that. I, I think people are still sort of taking in all of the things that you've told them, Dakashi Sensei. So my question is sort of at the intersection of ethics and safety. The more you automate something, the more you take the human out of the system who can feel discomfort if something goes wrong, this moral distress, discomfort, you know, engineering ethics scholars have used all sorts of terms to talk about and, and sort of describe that um, distress. This is a very meandering question. And so I guess what I'm I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do you think there is an ethical case to be made? Eth ethical. Ethical case to be made for safety too, because I think a lot of what guides the improvisation that you were telling us about is I think motivated by ethic, sort of ethical decision making, the desires of the people who are in these systems, these socio-technical systems, mm -hmm. to do the right thing. And that's why they break the rules when they absolutely have to. They are willing to experience discomfort like the, the mm. workers at the Onagawa site. It's a very meandering question. I guess I'm just asking, is there an ethical case to be made for for safety too, for keeping the human in the system, for not, for not sort of pushing ahead with automation mm. so much. Ethical aspect. It's a difficult to understand, a difficult answer. Okay, I try to answer. Mm. What should I say? Of course, pe people, are, workers are trying to do right, but sometimes they couldn't, they can't. So maybe I'm not talking about the comfort of the workers, but I'm, or instead I'm talking about their ethical decisions. Decisions made, they try to make decisions based on the ethical aspect. And the, sometimes they, decision is not so easy to make. So in that sense, what, how we decide wrong or right or wrong. It depends on the, I say, what is learned from the past. I'm sorry, this is what I can say. It, I'm not answering the question, but the ethical aspect, I need to, I didn't need to consider. Yeah. No, you, you did answer it. Oh, there's, a, there's a question. Yes, okay, please okay. go ahead. Thank you so much for the really interesting uh, presentation. I was wondering a little bit about the move, your advocacy, I guess, for safety too, and how that interacts with kind of activism um, or anti, um, um, particularly anti-nuclear activism, and oh. to what extent um, there is any kind of communication or overlap in terms of some of the priorities around safety in that context in relation to some of and some of these other communities. You might I see. have similar goals in some ways, but very different perspectives on them. So if you, I, I just wonder a little bit about that. I have always some activities, communication with the anti nuclear people. And the, yeah, the, this view graph shows very well. Maybe they are always thinking about the possible damage, more, which is more than the actual level. So, but they have to understand the, our human contribution. So, they always say that the, the nuclear power plant can cause this, this accident, this worse accident, but there's a human to try to reduce the effect of the outcome of the accident. So maybe they, they don't agree with me, but I try to say that the, there are humans, they carry safety to concept, try to makes the system safer and safer. So this is what I can communicate with such anti-nuclear activists. But I don't think they agree. <laughs> yeah, but I try to. 
Thank you for that. Oh, oh, you have, oh yeah. go, please go ahead. How do you think, as you've researched, safety two methods can or account for the risk of negative human contribution to safety? Negative. So, like, they're, they think it's a positive contribution, but mm -hmm. it's not working out that way. How do you think it accounts for that? Well, there's always a yeah, negative aspect. I'm, today, I'm talking only about the positive side. But the, there's always a negative side, but the which is almost about the safety one. And the adding the safety two concept that is focusing on the things that go well, maybe, as I said, it's complementary, safety one and safety two. I'm not blaming the safety one concept. Safety one concept is necessary, and which try to reduce the negative human perf performance. So, but the only the negative side, just pinpoint to the negative side, we are very much reluctant to go further. So what we needed to praise them and the focusing of the good things that may, that is already exist in the, it, it is already existing in the, every organization get good things. Am I answering question? We have the final question from, from my Takahashi student. Sensei's student. My student. <laughs> so, as same as you, I do hate the the optimization, like the the trend of the mechanization. But I do use the stairs instead of elevators, and I use PC instead of paper and pen. So, do you think it's possible to stop this trend? like this mechanization, automation? No, I'm always using the highly automatized <laughs> material <laughs> devices. Yeah, but the, it is different from the using the elevator or such kind of the system which reduce our physical role. But now system is try to reduce our intellectual load. That is something different from the previous one. But you, you, you are using deep L. <laughs> Yeah, I'm using heavily DPL to, for the translation. I, I have to admit that I, I see, I understand the uh, benefit of using that. But still, I do think that my English ability degrades. <laughs> so I try to take this opportunity to re re revive my English. Thank you for your question. <laughs> well, thank you for that fantastic talk, Takahashi Sensei, and for taking all of our many questions. And thanks to all of you for your thoughtful questions. But let's join, let's join me in thanking Takahashi Sensei thank you for very being much. with us this morning.